Hey y'all, welcome back to the podcast. I am your host, Vashti Sarah, and you're back to all the things. And I just appreciate it because it's Wednesday, you have tuned in and have decided to be a part of today's episode. So today's episode, what we're going to talk about is um, a condition that affects many different women. And I'll get into the statistics of that a little bit later on. But it affects many different um, women throughout the world. And it's called polycystic ovarian syndrome, also known as PCOS. Um, And it's something that I've struggled with for many years. I think I got diagnosed when I was 17, maybe, uh, maybe earlier. So it's been a hot minute since I've struggled with it. Or when I finally was diagnosed and was able to treat the condition, Um, So our aim today is to demystify the complex um, of this condition to explore various aspects of it and provide insight on how to manage um, this type of condition. And, you know, granted, I am no medical expert, but I've done a lot of research. I have researched up the wazoo. My mom has helped me out significantly to figure out ways to combat, to treat, to manage polycystic ovaries or PCOS. So... Polycystic ovaries, um, ovarian syndrome is a hormonal disorder and it affects people with ovaries. So if you're a female, you were born with ovaries, it affects women. Um, It's characterized by a combination of symptoms, irregular menstrual cycle, excessive uh, male hormones, the presence of cysts on your ovaries, and you know, it can cause it can be caused by environmental factors. So there's many different reasons as to why you can be diagnosed with polycystic ovaries. But I will use PCOS um, just so that it's a lot easier. So I don't keep having to say polycystic ovaries. So um, it's an endocrine met, 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 metabolic disorder that affects four to twenty percent of women worldwide. Let's just stop there. Four to twenty percent of women worldwide are affected by PCOS. And a lot of women don't even know that they have it. Um, A lot of women struggle with it and they don't even know that this is something that can be treated. This is something that have been widely explored, not really talked about. Um, But I do advise you at the end of this episode, after you hear everything that I have to say, go to your gynecologist, go see someone, especially if you feel like you um, fall in line with PCOS and the symptoms, go see a medical professional. Your body is so intricate and important. It is important for you to take care of it because in the long run, especially if you want to have children, it's important to combat and treat it now early on versus waiting until you're trying to have kids and you realize, oh, this is something that I could have been working on a long time ago. So um, let's talk about what PCOS commonly, you know, is thought of. Um, so the most common cause of PCOS or sorry, the most common thing that people look at that is not really PCOS is the lack of ov- ovulation, um, which it's that that's that's not what it is. PCOS, there's more attention and focus on it as it as it affects women on a whole in terms of, you know, the symptoms, all that. But, you know, there's nothing to it has nothing to do with cysts. It has nothing to do with cysts on your ovaries, ovaries, sorry, the cysts, in fact, uh, refer to eggs or follicles that are around your ovaries. So for some reason, they use the term cyst and it sounds very like, ah, oh, but really it's just eggs and follicles on our ovaries. Um, So it's a very weird terminology that's wrongly used for PCOS, but that's just what they've they've used for many, many years. So now let's dive into the symptoms and diagnosis. So what are the common symptoms of PCOS and how it is typically diagnosed? So disclaimer, there are three specific types of PCOS and all three types may overlap in like symptoms, um, but you have to know what type of PCOS you have. So 
Um, diagnosing PCOS involves a combination of clinical evaluation, medical history, physical examination, and sometimes hormonal and ultrasound tests to rule out um, any other conditions. Um, it is important to note that not everyone with PCOS will have the same symptoms. Some people will have all symptoms. Some people will have just two symptoms. Some people might just have the follicles on their cyst and it, it just got proven through an ultrasound. So Common symptoms of PCOS include weight gain, acne, irregular periods or missing periods, um, hair growth on the body, excessive hair growth on the body, um, hair loss, fertility issues, skin tags. So the types of PCOS you can have are insulin resistant, inflammatory, post pill, and adrenal. And um, sorry, I said three, there's four. <laughs> but we'll dive into what each one of those are. The first one, insulin resistant PCOS, is the most common of the four types of PCOS. And roughly 70% of women with PCOS have insulin resistant PCOS. So essentially, that is your body is resisting insulin, um, both as the driver and the symptom of PCOS. So this type of PCOS, high insulin levels in the body, which um, can be caused by stress, high levels. Um, you have a very high intake of sugar or insulin in your body, inflammation or imbalanced blood sugar, increase um, LH pulsatility. Um, so, you know, this this one obviously is the most common one. And that is actually the one that I do have or had. I will just walk in faith and say I don't have it anymore. But, um, you know, that is the one that I've struggled with. And one of the common ways to diagnose it is uh, through previous diagnostic criteria or you, they can measure waist to height ratio um, based on like if you're obese. They can also do an ultrasound to check to see if you have the uh, the um, not the cyst, but the follicles on your ovaries. So of the four types of PCOS, insulin resistant PCOS is the most common, but you know, you can treat it, you can prevent it and obviously do your research. But a lot of it is just to remove sugar out of your diet. Um, not just sugar, but anything that shifts from um, sugar to glucose, three, six, H12, one, six. I think that's the, that's the, um, I think that's the, the chemical, formula or how, how you say sugar or glucose in a biology, I might be wrong. So again, no medical professional here, but um, yeah, eat a blood sugar balancing diet, uh, maintain a healthy rhythm and sleep. Um, regular exercise is the best way to increase insulin sensitivity. So, you know, for me, what I did with insulin resistant um, PCOS or insulin related PCOS is <clears throat> I worked out a lot. I started working out heavily and started running, started including just a very intense exercise lifestyle. I started focusing on, you know, how I'm treating my body, what I'm putting in my body. And, you know, gluten is one of those things that sh turns from gluten to sugar, from gluten to glucose in your body. And, what you'll notice is whenever you eat gluten or high sugar, you get super bloated, um, you know, TMI, super hairy. And a lot of that has to do with my own genes, but I was abnormally hairier than most. Uh, I know when I went in to see my gyne gynecologist for the first time, you know, hair on your stomach, hair, obviously you have armpit hair, but hair in other areas. I really don't want to explain all the areas that have hair, but just use your imagination. Um, just, you know, a very excessive thick hair grow. And the one that she pointed out was around my, on my stomach, around my navel. And she was like, I know you're here um, to try to figure out what, what's causing, you know, your intense acne. Um, and I, I felt like I was supposed to be out of my acne phase. Like no one else struggled with acne as much as I did. And just like big cystic, you know, hormonal acne on my face, super insecure. And again, bloated after I eat certain types of food. Um, I never struggled with weight gain, 
Uh, there is a thing, lean PCOS and obese PCOS. And I had the lean PCOS. I was insulin resistant, but I think a lot of that had to do like not being on the obese side is because I was actively working out and I enjoy running fitness, all that. But what helped after I got diagnosed was changing my diet entirely. And, you know, your, your body adjusts and shifts as you go. So that's the insulin resistant, um, PCOS. Another one, uh, post pill PCOS. A lot of people don't talk about this and I want you to, to listen to this very strongly, like take in what I'm about to say and like, Take it with a grain of salt if you want. Consult your medical professional. Do your research. Post pill PCOS. This occurs once you come off an oral contraceptive pill. In other words, um, birth control. So if you have had normal periods before going on the pill, only to find out you have irregular periods post pill alongside symptoms of adrenal um, androgen excess then you are likely to have post-pill PCOS. These symptoms start as you come off the pill and are temporary. Um, you can only have post-pill PCOS if you have recently stopped hormonal contraception. But it, it they say temporary, but it can last longer than that. So just disclaimer, I mean, I know Big Pharma likes to promote a lot of their um, medication and I probably will be flagged for this, but I don't you know, for the life of me, don't support big pharma at all, because a lot of it is money making and they will push a pill on you versus finding holistic ways to treat your body. The matter of fact is the Lord has given you exactly what you need on this earth to combat whatever disease that you have, whatever uh, type of um, bodily disorder you have. And it's just, we, it, you, we have to do a lot of research and a lot of it is hidden from us. So I know that might offend a lot of people, but I, that's just where I stand. I'm a big advocate of finding alternate ways to treating specific or different types of symptoms. And there are ways to treat things. There are ways to combat things. We don't just have to pop a pill and it fixes everything. So um, post pill PCOS. And I will say, um, after I got diagnosed with PCOS, changed my diet, all that. And I think like five or six years, five or six years later, like, something shifted in my body and I had a major breakout again in, um, acne. And again, just like super, um, super like sensitivity to food. And, you know, I just didn't know it was, it was happening. So I, at that time I moved to the U S and I, you know, saw another gynecologist and explained everything to her. They did another ultrasound. They found out that the cyst had gotten bigger and that it was probably contributing to why I was having these severe reactions. I had like the most awful, not cramps during period, but like awful cramps outside of period. I would have um, just like discharge after a workout, like bleeding discharge after a workout and I just couldn't understand it. Obviously, it's worrisome. So, you know, I talked to her about it. And the first thing she said, oh, we need to put you on the pill immediately. And I sat there and I've always been the type of person who will just sit quietly. And, you know, if people please. I'm like, OK, sure, I guess I'll guess I'll try it. And um, I, I wish I didn't put my foot. I wish I had put my foot down, but I didn't. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll try it. Cause you know, I told her, this is what I've been doing. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. She's like, well, those aren't working. So we need to put you on the pill. So I was on the pill for three months, I believe, or less. I think it's less than three months or two and a half to three months. And right around the three month mark, my legs swole up like an elephant's foot. And I was having the worst allergic reaction or reaction to the pill. And it takes a while for the pill to kick in and do what it needs to do. But literally, like I was in a gym and suddenly I noticed my ankles were swollen. My legs were swollen. Had to go to the ER only to find out that I had like my veins were clogged or like where my blood flow was being constricted or whatever. But it was an um, it was due to the pill that I was taking. So got off of that. Haven't been on the pill ever since. We'll never get on the pill ever again. And that just shows big pharma doesn't know what they're talking about uh, for the most part. So I, I'm not an advocate for the pill. I mean, to each their own, do what you want to do. But honestly, before you 
listen to any advice from any health professional who is immediately pushing a pill on you, whether it be for PCOS or something entirely different, do your research. There are many side effects that can attribute to long-term um, ailments in your body. So just, just do your research, to be honest. Even with what I'm telling you, do your research. So that's another one, post-pill PCOS. Another one is adrenal PCOS. Um, of the four types of PCOS, adrenal PCOS is less common and less no a less known type. Adrenal PCOS is defined as PCOS where only the androgen that is raised is DHEAS, which means a person who has adrenal PCOS has normal testosterone and androtestnedrine levels. However, the insulin resistance and inflammation are not the cause of PCOS in this case. Instead, it is an upregulation of adrenal androgens that can cause it can be caused by a combination of genetic tendencies and environmental factors such as stress. So all that big language to say environmental factors, genetic tendencies that leads to adrenal PCOS. So mine also is a combination of, you know, um, what's it called? <laughs> I'm blanking out here. Let's just say it's pregnancy brain, but insulin resistant, but also adrenal PCOS because it is something that is genetic that was passed down. Um, obviously my husband and I are praying that if we have a daughter that will not be passed down to our child, it stops there. Cause it is something that affects you. And I will talk a little bit more on the mental game that it plays on you, but that's adrenal PCOS diagnosed with, um, if to be diagnosed with adrenal PCOS is only if you have raised androgen, um, which is not testosterone, it's a different androgen in your body. Even though your testosterone levels are normal, there's a different level that is higher that they can test to see if you have that one. Another one is, I am so sorry, um, is inflammatory PCOS, which this type of PCOS is due to an underlying chronic inflammation in the body. This may be due to factors such as underlying disease, food sensitivity, um, gut issues and intolerance, etc. cetera. Uh, and the underlying inflammation can be, can, causes an upregulation of androgens from the ovaries. So to diagnose this, um, with, to be diagnosed with inflammatory PCOS, you must meet PCOS diagnostic criteria as well as showing signs of inflammation such as an autoimmune disease, fatigue, skin disorders, joint pain or headaches, you know, all that blood tests, all of that can prove that you have um, inflammatory PCOS. So it is important to understand what type of PCOS you have because each PCOS is different and it can be treated differently and it should be treated differently. Um, and to know what factors contribute to it, obviously seek your healthcare provider. And, you know, I always try to go the holistic route. So find holistic doctors, holistic specialists that can help you walk through that because it's a hormonal issue, um, for the most part. So, um, what are potential long-term health implications associated with PCOS? So PCOS is linked to an increase of real increased risk of several health conditions, including type two diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and infertility. Managing PCOS and adopting a health healthy lifestyle can help reduce these risks and improve overall well-being. So I know I'm, I know I'm reading a lot, but I had to prepare a lot for this because I, like I said, not a medical profession. I want to make sure that I'm articulating correctly what PCOS it is, the different types that they are. So I have always been told um, that I am borderline diabetic, but that's because, which is strict to, to those of you who know me, who know how active I am and my body type, you'd probably be like, what? You are borderline diabetic. Yes, because diabetes runs in my family and my body, it rejects insulin. And it, it, it's, it, it's just, it doesn't process insulin the right way. So Obviously, that makes sense. I would probably be borderline diabetic. But again, I just have to eat properly, exercise, manage what I'm eating. I don't eat a lot of sweets anyways. Thank God I don't have a sweet tooth. I'm so thankful. Um, I'm more of a salty, spicy person. Every so often, I will have like a craving for brownies. Um, not during pregnancy, though, which is weird. I don't crave anything sweet during pregnancy. Actually, the taste of anything sweet it's just odd. It's like a foreign substance and I just spit it out. But 
before pregnancy, um, I would crave brownies or, you know, something sweet to eat. But um, yeah, so do manage PCOS well. There you can um, reverse the overall well-being of, you know, what your future looks like if you manage it well. And, you know, one of the biggest things that definitely stressed me out was when I heard the possibility of infertility and the loss of a child. And, you know, Jared and I, before we got married, I shared this in a previous episode, we prayed over my womb and we believed that the Lord would heal me and in the right time we'll be able to conceive. And, you know, it's still risky. Like I am four and a half or four and a quarter um, months pregnant, not four and a quarter, uh, four and three fourths months pregnant. And it's just, it, it is overwhelming to think about you know, what if, but we don't dwell on the what is. We know that the Lord is with us and his hands is on this child and what will be, will be, and we'll just trust the Lord through the process. But the idea of infertility was really hard to grasp and wrap my head around. And actually, you know, I, my husband and I were talking recently and he told me, he said, Vashti, when you told me that you had PCOS, there was a night we were on a date and he you know, told me he had a genetic form of cancer and how that can um, complicate us having children someday. Um, there's an 80% chance of one or all of our children having this type of gene. And, you know, that night I was also honest with him and I let him know, man, I'm very serious about you. I see a future with you. I need you to know that I have polycystic ovaries. One of the common, um, you know, realities of it or the implication of it is infertility or um, being, having miscarriages, et cetera, everything that comes with that, along with, you know, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, type two diabetes, all of that. And uh, a couple nights ago we were talking and he said, Vashti, that night when we were vulnerable with each other and, you know, we're, you know, honest with what life will look like, I obviously prayed and asked the Lord to heal both of her bodies in advance, heal your eggs, heal his sperm in advance that whenever the time come, we'll have the perfect child in God's image. But he also said, but God, I will be okay with, if that's not a part of your plan, if children aren't a, aren't a part of her plan, we'll walk through that process and I'll walk through that with her and it will be hard, but I am okay with that because ultimately we just want your will. And it just warmed my heart because one of my biggest fears of getting married was being vulnerable with my future spouse, um, that this is an implication and this, this, this can be something to walk through and being rejected for it, being ridiculed for it, being scoffed at for it, you know, um, like pointing fingers like you're to blame. I wanted, you know, an offspring and I, I just didn't want to be blamed for not being able to produce and the fact that he just reassured me, you know, I, you know, I told God, I will walk through anything with you and help me to be the man to, um, walk through that with my wife in a way that is honorable. And it just made me cry and it made me fall in love with my husband a million times more. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, just, it's a mental game that PCOS can play on your mind or it can plague you with is just the fact that what if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't happen the way I wanted it to? But ultimately, like I said in the last episode, we submitted that to the Lord and we said, however you want to, God, I'm not going to come up in my head and make up ways how my life should be. I just want it to be the way you want it to be. So, yeah. So what are some effective strategies of managing PCOS? I've mentioned some before. Um, so lifestyle changes plays a crucial role um, in, you know, a balanced diet regular physical activity, managing stress, medication. If you truly believe that you need medication, but like I said, try to stay far away from medication if you don't need it. Um, there are plenty of ways to alter your levels and to manage PCOS. And it might be more expensive because you're spending money on organic and clean food. Um, it might be inconvenient because rather than getting normal wheat, you're getting gluten-free um, so, you know, it might be complicated or it might be, what's the right term, um, inconveniencing or it, it can be an inconvenience because you have to change your lifestyle, your wants, your needs. But after a while, you just get used to it. And to be honest, food, this is controversial, food, 
I believe should be uh, to, to it, it shouldn't be something that you have to enjoy. It's part of it's part of your life, but it's mainly to live like you. It, it It's not a I think this especially the American culture, we enjoy food and we we put everything around food and. You know, but it's it's to live, it's to survive. Food is to survive on, not to enjoy and to binge and eat out and, you know, just to go all out on. So controversial, maybe, but just manage what you're eating and be willing to change your lifestyle. And, it, and like I said, it can be an inconvenience. But at the end of the day, if you want to have a better um living or quality of life you have to put in the work you have to put in the effort for that change so uh, PCOS can have emotional and psychological implications as well like I said it affected me tremendously in terms of knowing that I could struggle with infertility Um, it can lead to frustration anxiety even depression and you know every woman is different but I do strongly advise you clinging on to the Lord during this time, especially if you're a believer, submit that to God and pray over your ovaries, pray over your reproductive organ and just ask the Lord to help you through the process, to give you strength, to give you the the courage to walk through um, PCOS in a way that is healthy because it can overwhelm and consume your mind. So Yeah, that's about it um, in terms of the different types of PCOS, how to manage it um, and just, you know, breaking down the the complexities of PCOS. But before we conclude, I do want to emphasize something um, with you, and that is if you are a mom or if you're a friend of someone who is married and they haven't had kids yet, I strongly, strongly advise you to quit this verbiage being a part of your language. And that is, when are you going to have children? Um, because it's a, it's a triggering sentence. It's a triggering way to hurt someone who's struggling with either PCOS or uh, there's, a, there's a different one that's similar to PCOS, but it affects women. It, they have different symptoms. But... Um, just just be very careful how you're pressuring your friends and your family members to have children because you don't know what they're struggling with behind closed doors and you don't know the mental game that it plays on that person. And obviously we know you mean well, but at the end of the day, we're the ones behind closed doors who are grieving because we don't know if we can have children or we don't know, you know, what will happen. So there are several women who reached out to me after my episode last week and they, you know, emphasized my family is pressuring me to have children or, you know, they don't realize that we've been trying for years and I, I haven't been able to get pregnant. Please pray for me. Please put me on your prayer list. So, you know, if you need prayers, let me know, send me a message, comment, um, Below, if you're watching on YouTube, um, send me a message on Instagram and just say, put me on your prayer list, PCOS, put me on your prayer list, infertility, whatever it is, and I will pray for you. I'm very, I prioritize praying for women who have infertility issues, PCOS, or anything in that nature, um, and any, any other prayer requests that you have. But I do advise you, if you are listening, um, do not pressure your friends to have children. You don't know what they're struggling with behind closed doors, and you don't know how triggering those words can be. So my goal today was to provide just insight and understanding on PCOS, how to manage it, how to thrive despite what PCOS does and brings to the body. But mainly so to give you hope, there is a way out of this. There's a way to combat this. And I do believe in healing. I strongly believe that the Lord can heal your body. Um, uh, Remember, consult your healthcare professional. I am no healthcare professional here, but I'm just mainly giving based on personal experience, my intense study on PCOS. So until next time, Take care, be kind to others, and I love y'all so much. Thank you guys for supporting me. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the share button, and I'll see y'all next week. 